Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, I think he's actually given a really good background to what we have done so far. So I'm going to uh, try to actually I've uh, uh, structure the talk in a way that the, at the beginning we talk about the structure of the of the manual itself and the assessment tool itself, but later we will actually try to kind of do it in more like a storytelling way. So my name is Iris, um, Iris Huang from Arup, and I have been a project manager for this project for quite a long time, and you'll see later uh, what I mean by that. So I will take you through the project. So uh, Larry mentioned earlier about why we needed the Beam Plus neighborhood. That was because we actually recognize that there's a deficiency. So we're talking about only within your site. We're not talking about public realms, spaces in between buildings, and the collective performance of a cluster of buildings and what happens when there's a synergy or in fact if if it was kind of opposite of it. So it is a separate mechanism that will actually help fill the gap and I do hope that many um, you know projects do take up this this assessment tools and especially designed for a master planning stage. So it is you will see that later on that we, I will make a lot more reference to Hong Kong. So Larry has given you a historical and international background on what our tool is about. And the tool itself was very specifically made for Hong Kong. So, so there's a lot of reference to Hong Kong, what we have. It is also because of our unique urban environment that we have in Hong Kong. Um, so we actually are focusing on open space outdoor environmental quality and what it means to actually have a neighborhood in a compact urban environment and of course while having all the connectivity and convenience that we we continue to enjoy in Hong Kong. So these were des um, developed with the constant guiding principle of being very clear, being really specific. We didn't want to be vague so there's no room for, um, there's no kind of debates about it. Has to be practical. This is the tool for real projects. So it had to be very practical. And of course, at the end of the day, it had to be user friendly. We took into account of the existing professionals who work in this field and during the stages. So as Larry mentioned that we went through three major stages of a key task, and those are first looking at the global context. What does it mean? Who's doing what? When did they start doing it? How are they doing if they have already rolled it out? And looking at the Hong Kong context, looking at what we have, or what we had before, what we have, what we continue to have, how are they working, can we actually supplement them in a, in a way that it actually addresses the gap. And of course, we had to listen to all of professionals out there. So we did hold the um, stakeholder engagement exercise, which, which helped us shape this whole tool, which is what we have, which is BIM Plus Neighborhood. So I will be very quick. So when we were actually looking at the what we learned from overseas tools, we were looking at different contexts. America, lead ND neighborhood development, great, but it, their development pattern is extremely, extreme opposite of what we do in Hong Kong. We looked at what it means in UK, how do they really address the issues of governance, which is a, rather hard in Hong Kong's context, but nonetheless it offered the important values and lessons. We looked at closer to our heart about places like Singapore and Japan, and also we looked at how what are Australians are doing. They are trying to. I I actually come. Well, I was there before, and I know what they're really trying to do is that they understand the problem or pitfall of this Western-centric development where it's sprawling without a limit, and they're really trying to kind of go against the current, which is really hard because the people have gotten so used to it, used to having so much space, used to having two hour commute and having to listen to a radio in their car for an hour and a half every morning. So we looked at their market position, who is most successful, if they are most successful, why would that be? We looked at what stages the certification is done, when do they start, when do they finish, when do they get the certification itself? We had very, very long ones like Lead ND to something much shorter. Who gets to really assess these tools? We have to ensure the integrity and the quality of the assessment and the ongoing uh, maintenance and the development of the tool itself. And of course, the importance of being very defined about where we are assessing and what we are looking for from the project. And the support and drive, uh, drives that actually allows um, practitioner to be able to make inquiries and also be able to address the various uh, project-specific 
aspect and element, which is specifically, um, it is quite an important aspect because when the tool wants to go overseas, because the situation may be different, something that is expected in the US may not be allowed in elsewhere. We had to look at Hong Kong, of course, this is our home. This is extremely important that we actually look at Hong Kong. We need to make sure that something that made sense in Hong Kong, we don't get to transplant American suburb in Hong Kong and say, voila, we have the amazing suburbs. No, so we had to really look at Hong Kong. So of course we looked at being plus new builds and existing buildings, how it works. Do we, have we actually left out some bits? And we also looked at CPES tool that was developed a long time ago for planning department that actually addressed the, the bits that wasn't really addressed in the new buildings and existing buildings, more social issues, the operational issues. We had the engagement, stakeholder engagement exercise that was held over two separate days. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you could see, my hair was really short and my hair had gone long and then chopped it. So it had gone on for quite a long time. So we had had, um, we had a number of uh, participants from private sector, public sector, and of course the NGOs. Those who are uh, you know, deep in their, um, involved in this process as a client, as consultants, and of course, as the, from the government side point of view. So um, I will go through this really quickly because we, uh, Larry has already mentioned it. So I'll go through overall objectives and boundaries, which Larry mentioned earlier, how it actually applies and how, when do we really get certification, the aspects and credits and weightings and overall grading. So it is really for new or planned neighborhood, but like Larry mentioned, that we don't preclude existing buildings. So in fact, one of our piloting projects was an existing building where a major upgrade was being done to an outdoor space. It is trying to look at more comprehensive guidance to the practitioners, stakeholders, and of course the project owners, and reduce the undesirable effects and trying to preempt it very early on rather than leaving it too very, uh, much later and improve the quality of our built environment. And especially in terms of public realm, we are having to deal with issues of not having sufficient public realms. People are demanding greater and better quality of lives, greater open spaces out and better quality that they believe that they deserve, which I do agree. So we mentioned earlier, so this is the first tool that we have actually looked at what, is, what does that mean? How would you impact your neighbor or how would you be impacted by your neighbor? So it is really looking at, it, it is looking at two ways. You need to give some and sometimes you, need, you, you will also be able to benefit from what is in your neighborhood. So it looks at, um, so the idea is, is because we're trying to benefit both occupants and the neighbors. So those of you who are familiar with the Beam, uh, Beam Plus other tools and also many other um, the green building assessment tools, they actually specifically outline that their beneficiaries are meant for their, the tenants and building users. But we're looking at how, what can you do to the neighbors? What, how can you actually be a good member of a neighborhood? You're coming into an existing neighborhood. What can you really do as you're taking some perhaps you should offer something as well. We're not looking at anything that is um, internal space of a building. So whether it is about your building, other buildings, we're not looking at the actual internal space, which is actually to be de dealt with in the Beam Plus new buildings process. So we try to actually make it as embraceive as possible. We do have different typologies of buildings in Hong Kong from something that we are, that probably we know from all the villages that, that used to exist or the, the very few still remain, um, which still fascinates me to this day. And, the, and all the way to the podium structure with the um, transport oriented with the MTR uh, being connected and other modes of the public transport included. And of course we have, sometimes we get large plots like West Kowloon where you would have a sub landowners and have an authority that actually governs over it. So as Larry mentioned that this is designed to actually fill that front bit that doesn't actually. And what we believe and what we try to do was not just being an assessment tool, but actually being a design guidance so that everybody knows that this is what we believe that, um, that we should do and we should address. 
And as a result, there is also an issue of social and community issues that the other tools hasn't, uh, was unable to deal with. So there are, um, there are six assessment aspects. Can you believe I just had to count it, <laughs> having worked on it for four years? Um, there are six as, um, aspects, and that is community, site, materials, and waste that you could deal with or you could um, design, energy aspect, water, and of course, the outdoor environmental quality. So we're not looking at indoor environmental quality. That should be left to building owners. That should be left to new buildings. But we're looking at outdoor environmental quality to be supplemented by innovations in addition that any project team can actually propose as an innovation so, um, so that it can actually be addressed. And of course, the addition of the performance enhancement that that will be considered on a case by case. So when they actually tell it all together, they would actually be given a different grading. So that go from bronze all the way to gold, and we topped it up with the platinum, which is in line with the other Beam Plus tools at the moment. So this is a tool for building occupants and their neighbors. So we're looking at community. So this is the aspect that we felt that it was very important to single it out and have it at the very beginning. So when, before the engineers get on board, before maybe before the architect got on board, when the client is trying to think about what he or she can do with the project, why don't you address these issues? These should be considered. Those include socioeconomic issues and governance attributes that enhance the built environment and promote the sustainable lifestyle and encourage the local character of the neighborhood. So then it goes into side aspects, so looking at how you could integrate with the, your neighbor. If there is something that is not existing, perhaps it could be something that you could address instead of doubling it up. So it looks at things like open, open space, facilities, and of course, amenity. The water aspect is important. If there is water bodies, to conserve it, to look at how you could minimize the flood risk and alleviate the pressure on the stormwater management system and manage the stormwater and reduce the, the runoffs. So like I mentioned earlier, the outdoor environment is extremely important. We need to have better outdoor environment, whether it is about having a better design, whether it is about having a better daylight access. Maybe you should be able to look at the sky instead of being completely blocked off visually and acoustically what it means so that we could all remain healthy and very well. So next one is the energy that we're trying to look at how we could optimize and increase or promote the greater efficiency by looking at district scale energy and having a shared renewable energy generations. And of course the materials and waste which we deal with on a daily basis about how we could re reduce the environmental impact onto this um, with the materials and addressing the waste issue that comes at a very early stage of a project. So now I'm going to actually talk to you about more like, so now I have kind of gone through the really boring bits or much more structured. So anyone who's actually ever dealt with any type of assessment tools, I'm sure in, in buildings, in public health care or anything else, you know that it has to be very methodical, it has to be very, very structured. That's what we try to do, but we don't want to, want to bore you and we actually thought that we should actually talk to you on a based on the topics. So what will be these topics? So the first one that we wanted to talk about was how we want the project to respond to the community. So that could be a physical need, that could be an intangible need that there needs to be. So we actually try to encourage the engagement. So engagement, consult your end users or other stakeholders that could involve people like neighbors. existing community and economy. This is something that perhaps where a lot of friction between the existing locals and neighbors and the new project owners actually do generate from. What do you do with our existing businesses? What are you gonna do about it? Are you gonna compensate? How much is it gonna be? We don't know, but we want the projects to actually take, consider this before deciding we're gonna bulldoze everything and build it. So we're looking at how you could you could perhaps maintain local business because it is not just the business, but it is about having an identity, preserving the identity of a place, the social fabric of the community, and are you creating, are you, as a, as a result of the project, are you creating net job creation, employment? 
or would that be a loss? Perhaps, perhaps there may be a little thing you could do, but by actually studying it, we believe that it would actually start educating the professionals and the owners as well. Next one is about the responding, um, still responding to community. What can you really do about placemaking? Are you going to just make everything so, so monotonous or so identical that you can't really tell which part of the town you're in? Or is there something you could do? Can you make reference to the local history? Can you make reference to local businesses? So promoting the responsive design that actually will create identity and also give people the pride of their place. The other one would be um, placing a local, um, place making a local character, sorry, that is, um, the, another one is the cultural assets and how you could actually preserve and look at how you could adapt to, uh, introduce the adaptive reuse. So these together, we believe that we are trying to look at how these, um, what we are promoting actually respond to the community and perhaps being a better member of a new neighbor. So as you're coming in, so you introduce yourself and you're really starting to get to know each other about what you can do and therefore what you can provide. Next one is improving public realms. So Larry mentioned quite a few times about public realms and, and we know that we do need more. Everyone is craving more. Yes, we have great, great country parks and people go hiking and everything, but wouldn't that also be nice to actually have a place where you could go for lunch and sit outside and bask in the sun? So, minus the pollution. So we're looking at how you might actually be able to have that, um, the, the open space within the assessment area. So that is what's existing around you. So that if there is a park across the road, perhaps your people can go and enjoy, or you could actually have a picnic with your family or something. And of course, if you can provide that within your site, that would be really great for your, your building users. And if you do open that up, to a public that would actually bring in, that would double or even triple multiply the benefit of them. So accessibility is very important. We are, um, inevitably we are, I think we all know that we are actually an aging society. And like many developed societies in, around the world are like, we are actually, so we're not just looking at, can you actually have, is there pedestrian routes? Do we really need to get on the car every time? No, so you're looking at how you could actually walk to these this facilities and of course the hours of accessibility so that you could have a reasonably un unhampered access to these places so you don't kind of show up with your takeout lunch box and go, oh, the park is closed so you can't really go in today. Next one is about the quality of this open space. So the design is extremely important. It actually induces and it promotes a better health and well-being, and of course how people would cherish and use these spaces as well. So we're looking at the quality of open space, and of course it has to be, it has to be universal. So as we get older, so if you have disabled family members or friends, that, would be, that wouldn't bar them from entering those places and benefiting from the open space, beautiful open space. But also as we get older, this will be a more critical issues that we will all de demand and desire. So the comfort is also important. You, nobody want, no, none of us really wants to kind of sit in the middle of the football pitch and be completely exposed to 3 p.m. in the middle of July kind of sun. We need to look at how, can you, how you can provide the comfort in the open space. And that includes how you get there as well. So is there a shaded or covered walkway? Does that provide weather protection? Does it actually prevent the heat stroke, which is also an important as we are in subtropical environment? And of course, how you, um, when you are there, what is there? Do you have different options? So some kids, can some kids run around in the sun? Can some people actually do rest in the sh shade? And I think the, the last bits of the improving public realm is really about health and well-being. Unfortunately, I have learned after having moved back to Hong Kong, I have learned to really, really appreciate the blue skies of Australia. So now I find that when I actually go there, I find the air is too clean, that it's just too dry for me. But it is something that we all crave, that having a better air, air quality that perhaps 
just 10, 20 years ago, people took it for granted that we never really thought that we would actually have to see Hong Kong, Harvard, Victoria, Harvard like this way. And of course, noise is another issue that many of us, because we live in such close proximity to each other, that if you do have a football page and you happen to have a church next door and there's a funeral going on, perhaps that's not good. But same and, and other way as well, if whether it is about the place to work, place to live, or place to play. So, like I, um, so just to summarize, that we're looking at how we can, and once again, these are all turned into a requirement, the credit requirement, which will actually go tally to get into the final overall grading. So we're looking at the provision of public space. You have to have, well, there has to be a public space, and then you need to be able to know how to get there. So whether it is about wayfinding, whether it is about um, walkways that is segregated from the traffic. The design of the open space is extremely important so that you, could, you actually have a reason to go there and you have to be comfortable and while not compromising your health or well-being. Next one that we're looking at is how we can actually promote healthy and sustainable lifestyle. So you'll probably notice that some of these things are actually duplicated, but it is because you could do one thing and that may actually have a number of multiple effects. So it could be, for example, I could plant a tree if I have a garden, let's say. I could plant a tree. What does that do? That might help with um, cooling down of the space. I like it because I could see the greenery and there are other flow and effects. So that, that's why these are dressed in a separate yet sometimes duplicating. So we're looking at how the provision of the green space and blue assets. We all know that the importance of these spaces, especially when we live in such a compact environment, in the middle of the day, you don't get to go to Country Park, you're probably most likely going to be able to only go somewhere near five, 10 minutes walk away from your office or your home. We're looking at the walkability. Once again, we have to encourage them. You can't just say, there's a desert, you walk across and then get to the 7-Eleven on the other side. And I have seen those places in, in many other places in, in the Western places, uh, countries where Nobody would actually get to 7-Eleven without having to drive. And that is a ridiculous situation where in places like Australia, people are actually using a liter of gas just to buy a liter of milk. And believe me, milk is much cheaper than the liter of gas. And we don't want that. So we're looking at the walkability. We're looking at sustainable lifestyle. How can we? So we all live in a city. And how can we really encourage the sustainable lifestyle? It may be a physical space that you would provide for a community farming. It may be other programs that you have an intention of actually developing and also running. So it could be about, it could, be, it could really be anything. It could be a farmer's market. It could be a weekly education for children, something. But we do want them to think about what it means. So when I do build this thing, how do we really ensure that these people here will actually have a sustainable lifestyle? Therefore, all being happy. Cycling is something that, um, that can be a bit hard in Hong Kong. I can tell you that I probably won't cycle because I do live in, up in the hill and I, won't, I definitely don't want to go up there. But there are many other parts of Hong Kong where there's a great opportunity for leisurely cycling. And of course, I'm sure that could expand to something else like uh, people actually commuting on a bike. But where there is a possibility and opportunity with the existing cycle track, we're, we're trying to encourage them to actually develop and expand further and integrate it. Sorry, that should be noise. So noise is another thing that when you have major roads and other noise sources that you really want to address, it is a very, very complex. I can tell you the acoustic is extreme. Well, I find it. It's very, very hard to understand, and it's, it's a very complex area of study. So we wanted to actually make it more user-friendly. How do we really do that? Perhaps having a distance, the buffer distance between where you require a piece and, and where these noise sources are, that may be the way. So we're actually, once again, being practical and user-friendly. We're trying to keep, keep in mind that who, what kind of people are practicing, and how they could actually address the issues of noise. Same thing of health and, um, health and well-being. 
perhaps you can, we cannot do about the overall air quality of whole of Hong Kong or the entirety of so southern China, but it is something that you could address. Perhaps you don't want your children playing right next to, um, right next to a major pollution source. So once again, we're looking at how you could actually have those buffer distance, which will address and per at least make it locally and in a micro scale be better. So, so we have actually gone through how you would actually provide the green space and blue assets. These are water, the walkability, the addressing the issue of sustainable lifestyle, cycling, and the mitigation of noise and the air pollution. So next one we are looking at is a sharing with community. So this is where it's, it's quite what we are trying to promote in the community and the side aspect. So once again, remember, if you happen to be a next to an MTR station, your people will be able to enjoy the MTR connection. The same way, maybe there is, there is something. There is a possibility for you to share your open space with your neighbors the same way that you might share their open space. Like I said earlier, the cycling track could be integrated into the existing tracks wherever that's available. Public transport, so it is about how can you, so there, so we do, we do have one of the best, in my opinion, the best public transport in the world, and I am very proud of it. Um, but we do need to make sure that the people can actually get there in a, in a, by, through a safe and convenient environment. And of course, when you get there, this public transport needs to be a low carbon. Pedestrian routes, as I mentioned earlier, about being able to have a shared route. So uh, those elevated walkways that can be shared, it doesn't have to be necessarily just all yours. And of course, there may be some that has to be yours only, and the hours of accessibility. So these apply to both your, t your building users as well as the neighbors. The trees is an important issue. After this, we'll talk about specifically um, ecolog ecology and landscape aspects. But trees are something that we probably have heard more recently for a sad reasons, those fallen trees. But we really want to see if there is an opportunity that trees be preserved in situ. That is because when you're actually transplanting a tree, their chances of survival is very low, not to mention how expensive it could be. Therefore, a lot of energy that goes into accommodating these without a promise of a success that this tree will thrive in the new location. And these trees are also a cultural asset. We talk about cultural assets, and these are quite different from cultural heritage. So these are not listed monuments. These may be tangible, this may be intangible. So for example, Dragon Boat uh, Race, Dragon Boat Festival, many of us love, many of us do compete in it. It is, in fact, an intangible, intangible cultural asset, but I believe that we should really cherish and preserve. Is the project really making any effort, or if it, Perhaps it's not Dragon Boat, but perhaps there's a tree that has a much long history and cultural importance. Perhaps it could be uh, simple things like an old cha chan tang that's been there since 1930s or something. So these are things that are, that are not necessarily protected, uh, that are definitely not protected by the Antiquities and Monu um, Monuments um, Ordinance, but these are something that perhaps means a lot to your neighbors. And wherever that's possible, do try to preserve, if not introduce or adaptive reuse. So sharing with the community, as I mentioned earlier, so we talked about the open space, how you could actually have cycling tracks, the public transport and how you could access that through the pedestrian routes and the ecological value of trying to preserve trees and while also looking at the cultural value of the assets these, um, that, are not, that are not necessarily protected. So this one, we are talking about the, in, uh, the promoting greater, better landscape design and enhancing, enhancing ec ecological value. So when you do have an open space, it is really about an opportunity to introduce or enhance an ecology in an area where you may be. It will also be about tree retention. It will also be about how you may actually 
enhance or benefit from the nearby areas of ecological value. So if you are actually building something in the middle of Hong Kong, perhaps it, it is less likely, but if you happen to be on the fringe of an urban area where there is an existing area of an ecological value, then it is, um, it is your, in a way, part and partial, your responsibility to also not create any adverse impact on these areas of import, uh, ecological value, but also it gives you an opportunity to be able to enhance it and let it kind of, you know, seeps into our urban fabric. Tree-lined streets, something that we take for granted, but we also realize that some streets that have rather skimpy trees. So it is really about can we provide the comfort and of course the visual comfort and comfort of walking through the, in, under the shade through tree-lined streets. If you are providing tree-lined streets, think about how you're going to maintain and design a soil corridor. So you can't just say in the drawing, I'm gonna draw this tree, but in the underground, I'm gonna put all these pipes where there would be no room for trees to, to survive. So it's really looking at not just about how it might look in the 10 years later, but you need to make sure there's an ingredient that will allow these trees to survive and also thrive. So, so we're looking at the promoting the landscape and enhance ecology through open space provision, ecological value, the physical connectivity with the areas of the ecological value and also bringing that into the streets through a tree-lined street. So next one is the district scale energy infrastructure. We're looking at how you could actually improve that, improve the future building design through committing to have the certified uh, sustainable buildings, whether it is about being plus new buildings, existing building, and in other cases, it could also be relevant tools from overseas. About passive design, I mentioned earlier that we're not gonna really talk about the actual building design itself, but the disposition, orientation, building massing that are determined at the very early stage has to be addressed well. And those of us who are architects, we know that it's the easiest way to save most money in the future when you're actually operating looking at how you may actually address the district scale energy infrastructure that could actually have provide better, uh, better efficiency, also better convenience, and also not, be, not needing to have a heat rejection. The cooling towers on the street or individual AC, AC units, which is quite a, quite a problem in many, many older areas because of the dripping condensates and everything. So can you actually make use of them? And if you do so, can you actually have shared utility tunnels so you don't have to dig up every time there seems to be a problem? You suspect there is something, so you have to dig up. You have to hold up the traffic, obviously not during the rush hours, but sometimes it does happen inevitably during a very busy hours as well. Having a renewable energy system, how we could actually address these issues and how you could actually share this renewable energy. And by sharing, we're talking about feeding it back into the grid. And what it means is that perhaps when you don't have the sufficient demand for it, you could also make, uh, your neighbor could also make use of them. So there are some other unique features that we have addressed in Beam Plus new uh, neighborhood. And this one of the first one is that looking at the intra-urban temperature and urban heat island effects. So we all know that being in the urban area of Hong Kong, it's always much, much hotter. I always notice because I work in Mong Kok, I live in rather leafy areas, so you kind of can feel that temperature difference on any summer, summer's day, even now. So we're trying to address those issues. Visual quality from open space. You don't really want to be in an open space where you are blocked up by four meter concrete walls, what would be the visual quality when you're in that open space, whether it is a park or playground or soccer pitch. Also looking at the reflectivity, the glare studies. So this is something that has become more and more issues in many places, not simply because of the glare issue, but also because you may actually be reflecting and deferring a lot of solar heat gain to your neighboring buildings. So and it, it, it obviously has an impact on how people use and inhabit the space, which would eventually 
eventuate into greater operating costs. So the glare study is something that hasn't really been addressed in Hong Kong, and it's not really addressed in many of other tools, but we wanted to really address because we live in such close proximity to each other. Diversity of housing types is another thing that we addressed in the community aspect. So once again, it is you desi deciding on the types of housing or the sizes of the, those units. When you do so, perhaps think about if you could introduce diversity in terms of size, in, ter in terms of tenure types, where it would mean that you are actually accommodating people of different ages, different income level, therefore actually promoting greater cohesion in this society. So, so these all together, um, and there is the, another one which we uh, don't have the picture, but which is about the corporate social responsibility reporting. So we're trying to, address, trying to encourage the project owners to, be, to, to, to display and to project a good corporate citizenship by having these corporate social responsibility reporting that is available for public viewing. So together, we believe this will be a great and important addition to the existing tools, uh, the suite of Beam Plus tools. And we believe it is a cogwheel. So in itself, may not be perfect. Of course, it's not going to be perfect. Uh, and we intend to continue to develop this. I know GBC is intending to continue to develop these things. But it is something, it is our starting point, And we are very proud. So I think with that, I will, I'd like to thank um, Hong Kong Green Building Council and also the um, architectural, the Ronald Liu and partners, PlanArc and the Urbis who also work with, with our team, my team, in addressing all the issues and making sure that we don't actually, um, we try to address the issues that are relevant in Hong Kong as much as possible. Thank you. Should we take questions? Are there any burning questions right now, or should we wait until the last section? Mm, okay. So maybe we'll take some questions now, and then we would for 10 minutes, I sure. think. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a question on um, community engagement. Uh, in, the, in the urban context, this part particular challenge is moving along the uh, participatory ladder. Um, for the past 40 years, there's always been informing and consultation. Mm -hmm. And how do we tackle it into more participatory in a partnership like a share hacks or something similar, rather than simply addressing at a local level? Yes, we, do, we did have quite a few questions about this engagement. Uh, in some places, this is a very mature practice that people know, then they know how to actually deal with it. So as a neighbor who may oppose to certain aspect of development, or as, um, and also as a project owner, then they understand their responsibilities to actually listen to. Having said that, in Hong Kong, we don't have a mature culture of engagement. We know that uh, some of the major projects, such as with Kowloon, airports, or some other projects, have to go through this consultation. But which are, um, but in other, the the standard practice is that as long as the project is compliant, you don't really have to go through. So we wanted to introduce a little bit by little bit. We, as a neighbor who are being consulted, we need to mature into. We learn. We need to learn what it is our responsibility, and also the other party as well. So what we really try to address is that you know, at least try to make an effort consulting. So we're looking at how you would consult, who, whom you are consulting. So this, this, could, be, this could include um, your, your end users. It may include other stakeholders. It may include district council, so all the others. And we're looking at how you may be able to hold the engagement and also address the comments, whether you incorporate that into your design or not. So these are actually step-by-step aspect of um, stages that we are trying to promote. Anyone else? Yep. I 
thank you. Um, oh, see, the concept is uh, very good. I'm not an architect, I'm an engineer. Mm -hmm. But uh, to my point is, um, how are you going to encourage uh, the developer to spend money right now? You know the land is uh, so expensive right now. Mm -hmm. you, we are talking about uh, uh, providing a buffer, a bigger area with the same land they are going to develop. Uh, what will be uh, the investment value? Mm -hmm. how, how many years they have to get it back from the return? Uh, or do we need any support from the government to put it like a statutory requirements on that? <laughs> I don't get to speak on behalf of the government. So um, wouldn't that be wonderful if we could... Yeah, okay. I think you know, this is a very uh, pertinent question. You know. But of course, as far as uh, Hong Kong GBs is concerned, uh, you know, it's something that you know, I think the Hong Kong community, you know, not just the Hong Kong GBC you know, should do, right? But of course, if you're talking about the incentive or any other support, you know, uh, later support from government you know, to, to push it forward, uh, I think it's very much you know, beyond the control or beyond the terms of reference of the Hong Kong GBC or even the BSL, right? Now, as I explained earlier, and if you look around, you know, a lot of people are actually doing it right now, okay? So, um, do you think that, you know, Hong Kong and its people, the industry should lag behind? Now, this is, I think, you know, should be the fir very first question that you know, we should ask ourselves, right? Money, of course, matters. I understand, you know, because I'm in the consulting business, you know, for a long time. I know very well, I'm sure a lot of you, you know, a, lo a lot of the audience here, you know very well about the mindset of developer. But, but if you look at life, you know, there are values in which are intangible, isn't it? You know, not everything you know, can, be, can be price tag, right? But of course, you know, we'd wo we won't rule out you know, whether later on you know, when the industry uh, is getting, or is getting you know, uh, momentum about this particular application, you, know, you, you never know. You know government you know, might step in and say, hey, you know, we think this is a good thing for the community and we find a way to support it, like you know, what they have done you know, for the new building too. Or maybe they, I think they are doing something you know, for the existing building too right now, as far as I understand. Maybe for now, uh, thank you, Iris, for give, um, introducing the tool to us. So for the third part of the presentation, we are going to uh, uh, invite uh, Mr. H.K. Lee to come on stage, and he's going to um, tell us a bit about the new qualification with this rollout of the uh, Beam Plus neighborhood. So um, welcome, uh, Mr. Lee, please. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of BSL and then move on to uh, the uh, credentials for Beam Pro uh, neighborhood uh, development. Uh, I know some of you are Beam Pro, so you probably know the, uh, uh, the front part of what I'm going to say, so please bear with me because I understand some of you uh, do not know too much about the BSL background. So uh, let's get started. Um, Content, uh, there'll be a, roughly about four parts in my presentation. We start with Beam and Beam Society Limited, and then practitioner, credentials of Beam Pro, and credential maintenance for Beam Pro. Uh, Beam and Beam Society Limited. Beam, uh, if you don't already know, Beam stands for Beam, a Building Environment Assessment Method. Uh, this is uh, a Hong Kong developed uh, green building rating tool is designed for the Hong Kong situation, the Hong Kong environment. It's a voluntary assessment tool uh, suitable for high-rise building and the subtropical climate. Beam Society Limited. Um, the, this, this seminar tonight is organized by Green Building Council, but uh, when you do the training and examination, it's conducted by Beam Society Limited. It's a non-profit non public body developed and implement the Beam Plus assessment tools, and it does the assessment and, and uh, suggest the rating. Uh, on a per capita basis, Beam is one of the most widely used voluntary green building labeling uh, scheme of its kind in the world, as we understand. Uh, train, we train Beam professional, what we short, uh, in short we call Beam Pro, and Beam affiliate. Beam practitioners. Um, 
Um, first of all, we started with Beam Professional, what we call Beam Pro. The key role of Beam Pro are to integrate the green building standards and practice into everyday building planning, design, construction, and operation, and assist the client to achieve the desired green building rating level. Um, in short, you can say uh, Beam Pro, they could be a consultant who help clients and uh, the non-professional clients to how to uh, achieve a beam rating. Or they can be actually be uh, people in a, a developer or somebody who develop building projects and help them uh, develop the des design of the building to the appropriate level of the beam system. Um, beam Society Limited, in short we call BSL, uh, organized beam pro training and examinations. Other than beam pro, there's another class we call beam affiliate. These are people who may be not in, at a professional level, but they are still very interested in the beam system. They are created by Green Building Council as competent to support the, beam, the green building design, construction, and operation, or in short, to support beam pro in the development or in the uh, uh, consulting business of uh, the BEAM system. In a typical project setting, BEAM affiliate work under a BEAM Pro to support the green building certification process. So they may be uh, knowledgeable in certain areas of, of the BEAM system, uh, maybe not the entire system. Credentials of BEAM Pro in, under the uh, neighborhood uh, system. Okay. First question, uh, are you a Beam Pro? If you are already a Beam Pro, it's easier. Uh, you go to the uh, left-hand side. Yes, you're a Beam Pro, and you can you, uh, receive the uh, NDCPD training organized by GBC, and you go directly to the exam. And if you pass the exam, you become Beam Pro with a credential of ND. If you're not a Beam Pro, then you go to the right-hand side, you start with the Beam Pro Fundamental course, which is a, uh, uh, the basic course of the entire Beam system. And then after that, after you pass that, you can select one of the four electives, and uh, neighborhood being one of the four electives. And if you pass that, you become, uh, and you do the ND exam, and then you become a Beam Pro uh, ND, which is the same qualification. If you're not a Beam Pro, um, okay, let's say how you start uh, from step one. If you are not a Beam Pro, you, you are very interested in the system, then the first question is uh, your basic entry requirement. Um, any practitioner who has met the minimum entry requirement of Beam Pro, whether you want to do new building, existing building, interiors, or neighborhood, or any accredited BEAM affiliate who has fulfilled the prescribed entry requirement as follows. A is maintenance of BEAM affiliate qualifications of three consecutive years. Or uh, in pursuing a specific BEAM Pro destination, a BEAM affiliate must demonstrate experience and knowledge by proving involvement in the BEAM or BEAM Plus project under which applicable rating tool is used. So you, you, you work under a BEAM Pro or assisting a BEAM Pro. Okay, the exam system. Uh, this, is, uh, this will be launched in 2017. Okay, uh, I don't know if you can read all the details. On the left-hand side uh, is the fundamental course. So if you're not a Beam Pro, you're not a Beam affiliate, you wanna start, okay? Start from the bottom. At the bottom is that starts here. First of all, you do the fundamental course. It's a 1.5 hour video. So you do it at your own time. You go on to the, uh, the, to the uh, uh, BSL website and you start from there. After you study the video, you move up to do a online quiz, which is 20 questions in 40 minutes. If you pass that, you move on to the right-hand side and keep going. If you don't, then you can come back and try it again. Okay, you have three chances to redo it. Uh, if you eventually pass, then you move on to the right-hand side. But if you fail three times, then unfortunately you have to start all over again, okay? You have to do the registration, pay the $1,000, and restart all over again. Okay, now, if you pass, 
you go to the right hand side. There are four electives in the white uh, rectangles, a new building, existing building, uh, interiors, and na <coughs> neighborhood. Sorry. So you can elect any one of the four, or if you want to take all the four, uh, one by one. Uh, new building, the training uh, is six hours. Uh, the fees for that is 3,500. Existing building training is six hours, 3,000, uh, 2,000, sorry. And interior, the training is two hours and it's $1,000. And for neighborhood, it's two hours and it's $1,000. Now, each one of these electives, after you uh, attended the, uh, the training, you do the exam in the yellow rectangle, uh, the, the yellow square. For new building, you have 100 questions and you have to do it in 120 minutes. For existing building, you have also 100 questions and you do it in 120 minutes. For interiors, you have 50 questions and you do it in 60 minutes. And for neighborhood, you also have 50 questions and you have also 60 minutes. These are all multiple choice questions. You don't have to write any text or uh, description, okay? If you pass the uh, purple uh, diamond, you move on and become a Beam Pro with that credential, okay? You can do one or two or three or four as you wish. You may do all four if you like. We do encourage you to do all four if you are interested. Um, who can apply? Now, the, this is so-called the basic qualification before you start applying. Um, first of all, you either, if you are a professional, you would have a degree or equivalent in the built environment related disciplines, plus a minimum three year post degree uh, professional experience, uh, plus qualification as a full member of a relevant professional institute. So we normally we accept like Hong Kong IA, architects, engineers, landscape architects, planners, surveyors, or Hong Kong IUD, okay? Uh, if not, if you are not a professional to start with, then you can, if you have a degree or equivalent in bio environment discipline, but you do not belong to a professional institute yet, then you have a slightly different route, which is a requirement for a five-year postgraduate experience. Okay, some people may, may choose that route. And fundamental course, back to what we discussed a little earlier, the fundamental course introduce the entire Beam Plus framework. The principle and basic knowledge of Beam Plus rating tools, procedures and the submissions, uh, 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 Beam Plus submissions, and all the terminology. So it's, it's all inclusive of the fundamental uh, system of Beam. Um, format, the exam, um, uh, sorry, the uh, training. The online training and the fundamental course uh, is conducted online, so you can do it at your own time. Uh, it's 1.5 hours, we just mentioned. Language is basically in English. And <clears throat> passing mark is you have to have 70% of the 100 questions correct. Okay. Um, some important note. Non-Beam Pro must take the fundamental course as a prerequisite. You have to do that first. You must do that first before enrolling on the elective course. Upon successful completion of the quiz, candidate will be eligible to opt into any elective course within two calendar years, okay? Candidate failing the quiz can gain free access to the online. You can restudy the video again and take the quiz again for a maximum of three times within 10 working days. And you, should, you can only do one retake each day, Like you can't redo it again and again in the same day, okay? We, we, we just want you to you know, take your time, do study the video, know what you're supposed to know before you take it again. Candidate failing to complete the quiz within 10 working days will have to re-enroll and start all over again. Um, Beam Pro uh, credentials. Uh, like I said earlier, you can choose new building, existing building, interiors, or the new system uh, neighborhood. For existing Beam Pro, uh, how to apply? Um, candidates are required to complete the Beam Pro 
and the, this is uh, just coming down onto the neighborhood system. Beam Pro and the training course organized by GBC. Um, neighborhood is uh, organized by GBC. The other three electives are organized by BSL. Beam Plus Neighborhood Examination is, is, is administered by uh, Beam Society Limited. Uh, the examination is, but the training is by GBC. Beam Pro can submit application form to Beam Society Limited. Examination fee, um, first time examination fee is 600. If you need to retake, it's 360. Uh, there's a special offer if you're interested. If you register for the ND exam before the end of this year, you have a one hour CPD coupon for BSL online training that will be given to you. <clears throat> we'll talk about CBD in a second. Uh, exam. exam. The coming up exam is December 2nd. Okay, if you've already taken the October training, you can uh, apply for the December 2nd uh, examination. Uh, time, there are two slots, 4.30 and 6.30. And fortunately, 6.30 is quite popular, it's full already. So if you do want to take the December 2nd exam, you can only take the 4.30 session. The venue is Green Building Council, which is uh, in the Jockey Club environmental building just across the road, if you are familiar with it, the round building just on the other side of the road, on the first floor. Um, the exam will be paper-based, multiple choice questions with four options. All questions are multiple choice, and each one has four options. It, It'll be in English, and a uh, number of questions are 50. You do it in one hour, and you need to get 70% correct. So that means 35 questions have to be correct. Important note, test the, the, the test is testing your understanding of the assessment system under Beam Plus ND. It's an open book uh, exam, so you will be given the manual of the Beam Plus ND uh, at the exam venue, so you don't have to bring your own. Uh, it'll be a clean copy with no marks on it. Okay, that's why we don't want you to bring your own. Uh, you don't have to memorize all the credit points. You just have to be familiar with where everything is so you can quickly go to it and pick out the details. Okay, so you, you need to be familiar with the system and where most of the things are, okay? Kennedy passing the ND exam can become Beam Pro uh, ND pass, remember if you pass, you have to go to GBC website to register and become Beam Pro, okay? Then your name will appear on GBC website, the list of uh, Beam Pro NDs. If you fail, you need to retake within one year from the first exam date, or you start all over again, okay? Credential maintenance, okay, uh, CPD. Uh, a lot of professional institute would have that system, uh, continuing professional development. Uh, after you become Beam Pro, you get your qualifications. You need to maintain it every year. Every calendar year, you're supposed to do six mandatory CPD hours and nine general CPD hours. Uh, you can go to the website to check out the details. Basically, what it means is mandatory hour, uh, CPD are the, uh, those uh, events or, or seminars organized by BSL and GBC. And others, other ones that are not organized by the two institutes, we call them uh, general CPD hours, okay? So you need to do that, do enough of that every year to maintain your, your uh, credential. It's a little bit sale pitch, apply now. <laughs> Prepare yourself for the exam. Basically, that's all there is. Thank you very much if you have any questions. Um, just a little bit of extra information for you. The, if you want to do the Beam Pro ND training, the first one was held in October 18th, so you missed that one. But there's another one coming up November 24th, which is next week. And you can still register for that if you want to, okay? And you, if you are very dedicated and you're very efficient, you can probably make the December 2nd exam as well. So go for it.
Any questions? Or have I explained it too good? Yes. For the online exam, uh, you mentioned seventy percent to be uh, to be a passing mark. Yes. So will we be told after we carry out the failed test what did we do wrong? Yes. Or we uh, do not know the answer. Okay. So I understand uh, the the online test. Um, if you when you go through the test, okay, you can pick the answers. And there are certain ones you can say, okay, I'll come back later, and you just leave it blank. And anyway, after you finish everything, you decided you finish, and you press the, uh, I don't know what button that is called, submission or, or confirm, whatever. Then all the questions go to the computer, and it does the, the uh, evaluation right away. And you will be told very quickly whether you pass or not. The answers. Um, you mean, will the computer tell you what is the right answer? What are the wrong answers? I don't think it does. Uh, it just tells you how many questions you got right. Because we have to recycle the questions. So if I tell you all the right ones and the wrong one, then the question is we can't use it again. OK? We have a pool of questions. And every exam, they pull a certain number and put it in, the, in, in a particular exam. OK? And we have to keep uh, recycle them. <laughs> so we can't. Uh, but actually, it's. My experience is not so difficult. If you do spend time to study the manual, it's not that difficult. Okay, it, it does take some time to study. So, uh, if you like, for example, when I did the the, the new building, uh, I, I'm not that quick, so I took five days to study manual. And when you go to the exam, it doesn't look that hard. And there there are some questions that are easier. You can do it in a few seconds, and some you do take some time to think about it. So. You do the easy ones first, OK? <laughs> Make sure you get enough uh, passing mark first. And then the more difficult ones may take you a minute or two minutes, then you leave it till later, OK? Anything else? I hope you all do it and you all pass. Thank you.